This is our Sunday School lesson number 11 from Unit 3, February the 14th, 2016. And the title of our lesson is Feast of Weeks. The devotional reading is Romans, the 7th chapter, verses 14 through 25. The background scripture is Numbers chapter 28 verses 26 through 31, then Leviticus chapter 23 verses 15 through 22, and also Acts the second chapter verses 1 through 36. And our printed text is Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 22. Our key verse is Leviticus 23, verse 16. And the aims of our lesson is to describe the Feast of Weeks and list its key elements explain the significance of making provision for the poor in the midst of participating in worship traditions, and to suggest one way to better provide the poor by using the principle lifted in Leviticus 23 verse 22. As we begin to indulge ourselves into the lesson today titled the Feast of Weeks which also uh, is referred to as the Pentecost and the Feast of Harvest. Uh, there are several titles which are associated uh, with this celebration, uh, with this uh, moment of holy worship unto the Lord. Um, as we begin to unravel this uh, with the help of the Lord, we would like to uh, look at how God unveils His purposes and uh, His understanding unto us through the word of the Lord in Scripture. Uh, as we're talking about feast, uh, we will read in Genesis, the first chapter and the 14th verse. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now we are very much familiar uh, with that passage of scripture, but what we would like to lift today is how do we know the significance of certain dates or months or periods of time and uh, how that significance is unveiled to us. Uh, how does God designate to us the things he wants us to render attention to? And as we uh, look at the wording in Genesis 1 and 14, as for days and years, those things we are familiar with, but what does God mean when he says signs and seasons? Um, seasons is translated as feast, or we should say appointed times. And the word in Hebrew uh, means moed, or the word in Hebrew is pronounced moed, and it means appointed time, uh, a fixed time. And then the word signs, that is translated as 
signals. And in the Hebrew, it means, or the, in Hebrew, the word is pronounced oath. And so, when we are looking at that passage of scripture, we understand that what God is saying to us is, is I will send signals at appointed times to unveil to my people what I expect from them and also what I am going to do for them and towards them. So God doesn't use Instagram or text messages or emails or God doesn't uh, use uh, all of the electronic technology that we have today. But God uses his own creation and he causes his own creation to signal unto us that this is the appointed time where this worship is to take place. And so uh, when we look at our practice of uh, last uh, week, we were talking about the Passover. And when we look at the religious observations that we render uh, to scripture and to our uh, celebration and practice thereof, the sun, God's creation, travels a path where it reaches a low point. And this is during the winter solstice. But then, although it appears that the sun, as some have described it, has died, the sun then begins an ascension. And it begins to rise on its orbit. And when it rises, it crosses the equator, which is referred to as a pass over. And it passes from the winter solstice into the spring equinox. And this takes place, and we call it, or as it has been termed biblically, uh, it symbolized the Passover before the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. And this was a signal that God was sending to the Hebrew people to alert them to the fact that one day they would be celebrating the Passover of the sacrificial lamb, Christ our Lord and Savior. And so when we look at how God sends messages to us, I would also like to read uh, the second verse of Leviticus, the uh, 23rd chapter, the second verse. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feast. Now again, we look at the Hebrew translations of these words to gather a clearer understanding. But again, when we're talking about the feast, these are appointed times. These are seasons. And therefore, a very significant part of this passage is, is that the word of God does not say that these are the Hebrews feast. He doesn't say these are the Jews feast or the Christians. He says, these are my feast. These are my appointed times. These are the things that I have designated to send a signal, an alert, an alarm to you that you should be observant 
of the things that I am about to unveil to you. And as we listen or as we study the Word of God, we also must recognize that the Hebrews during the biblical times one of the natural occupations or one of the natural forms of um, recreation um, for the people in that time was the study of God's creation his heavenly bodies just as uh, we have certain practices among ourselves that at certain times of the year um, those that hunt um, and the prey that they hunt for there's a season set aside for them and at that time then they say it's deer hunting season it's duck hunting season um, there are those that fish have uh, different periods of time where the fish are more plentiful or that the catching is uh, a lot more successful so there are seasons and periods of time where certain practices uh, or normal activities among the people well during the biblical days a normal practice for a family uh, was to come out onto the rooftops of their homes and you know that in biblical times a lot of the rooftops were made with hay and straw and they would lay upon the top of them and gaze into the heavens and after so many years of study and I'm not talking about stargazers and I'm not talking about astrology watchers and I'm talking about people who were in tuned with the spirit and the nature of God and studied God's creations so that they would see through his creation the signs and symbols that he was sending to them that they might be in accord with his expectations. I believe as the people of God we need to own what is God's and because the wisdom the creation the understanding which is unlimited has been misused by man and by institutions and by commercial agencies throughout the land to make money of the things that God has created I believe that we as believers should not be taking a second seat and allowing those who deceive and those who try and commercialize upon God's creation and allow them to have precedent over those who are the true believers of God as the scripture says let the redeemed of the Lord say so now another issue that was raised in the second verse out of Leviticus 23 uh, speaks of the holy convocations and uh, this is uh, the focus of our lesson today is is that we are uh, looking at this period which ends with the number of 50 it is seven periods of seven Sabbaths seven times seven and then on the morrow the 50th day it began the feast of weeks and uh, we recognize it as the holy convocation now there is a lot in our text today and I'm certain that uh, just as we will never 
fully uh, unravel the mysteries of God from the Bible, we will not uncover the significance of everything that is lifted in the scripture today. But as we look at this focus on the Feast of Weeks and the things that God set forth uh, for the people to do as they begin this period of worship unto the Lord, one is the Holy Convocation. And that also in the Hebrew, the word Mikra, Mikra, which means a dress rehearsal. It is a preparation to prepare for when the real event takes place. You have already been in preparation and already preparing yourself for the Pentecost. And this practice and we understand that scripture is telling us in our lesson that there were two periods, that there were two periods of the first fruits. And one of the first fruits was lifted in the uh, period of right in around March and April. Um, this was the first advent of the first fruits. The next one was entered 50 days after that. So the first was right at the Passover, and then the next one was offered at the 50 day period after that Passover. And when we look at it, one was the barley harvest, and the other one was the wheat harvest. And so when we look at the connection here between those two, there are two periods of harvest here. And what our significance is saying to us is that there was one in the spring and there was another in the summer. And we are witnessing here how God, in his ultimate wisdom, has manifested that he has provided, he has yielded unto us those provisions which are needed for us in the early significant parts of our life. And also in the latter, there were two harvests. Now, of course, our focus has been drawn to the Pentecost. And our focus is lifted upon um, the culmination of what took place at the end of those 50 days. Now, we recognize that there were different sacrifices that were offered. There was a wave offering. There was a burnt offering. There was a sin offering. There was a peace offering. And when we look at what these offerings actually uh, symbolize for us, we are reminded of the attitude of the giver during these different offerings, such as during the burnt offering. A uh, burnt offering was meant that uh, you would bring unto the Lord a lamb without a blemish, symbolic of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. But it was connected with being a meat or a meal offering. It was uh, rendered for consecration and dedication. But we want to lift something about the attitude of the giver. And that we want to bring from a scripture out of Matthew. 
This is Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 23rd verse. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, if you bring your animal sacrifice to the altar, or if you bring your flour and your wheat or your oils, uh, sweet fragrances uh, to the altar, uh, if you bring a bullock to the altar, or if you bring two lambs to the altar, to the altar, it says, and there remember that your brother has something against you. 24 reads, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So as we look at the different animals uh, that were brought to be sacrificed, uh, as we look at the processes and the things that were followed according to the law, we really need to look at the significance of why this was done in the first place and uh, of course we know in the church we uh, recognize and we understand the significance of the animal sacrifices the burnt offerings the peace offerings the sin offerings we understand what scripture is saying but we also realize that we are in a period now where God said through scripture he was dissatisfied with the constant slaughter of animals as though that would compensate for and take place for our ill uh, attitudes and behavior. So therefore, Hebrews 10 tells us Therefore, um, Hebrews 10 and 5, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, Christ speaking of God, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Again, some people are upset that there is a supreme, divine reality, spirit, God all by God's self that has everything in control and in order. And many of us feel as though we're deprived of the freedom to make choices and decisions for ourselves. But the God that we serve even provided that vehicle for us as well because he gave us free will. The choice to be able to choose to serve God or to serve others. So as we're looking at the text, speaking of uh, towards the end, when we come into the, uh, the scriptures uh, speaking to how this uh, sacrifice and what should be done uh, to the poor, now, of course, again, we're making the association that we're looking at two periods of harvest here, the early and the latter. And when we think of this, verse 22 speaks of, uh, first I want to read verse 21, and it says, Ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. We need to really expound upon 
uh, the fact of that we need a period of time where we cease our daily functions which have so many of us this day and time stressed out and people suffering from anxiety attacks and people going through periods of depression and we are making time for everything else but the Lord and the Lord is telling the nation that I want you to set aside seven Sabbaths and at the end of that time I want you all to come together because when I see you come together to honor me I will be in the midst of your gathering this is the holy convocation this is the gathering of God's people and when God sees us in obedience to God it is not that God has left it is not that God is not among us already it is that when we are obedient unto God God will allow us to see his spirit present in our midst because of our obedience unto what he has required of us assemble ourselves together so at the end it says and when ye reap the harvest of the land the harvest that I provided for you and the land that I promised to you the land that I gave to you thou shall make clean riddance of the corners of the field when thou reapest neither shall thou gather any gleaning of the harvest if there's anything that's left if there's any residue if there's any uh, uh, any of the abundance that was provided and after the gathering has taken place if there is anything left you can't gather that for yourselves but it says thou shall leave them unto the poor and to the stranger I am the Lord your God now now look at how scripture says this it says that we should leave that not in a bin not wrapped up not boxed not packaged but it says to leave it and leave it in the field therefore the poor and the stranger can do the same thing that those that God already provided for did they can come to the Lord and receive his abundance but it didn't say to package it for them. It didn't say to take it to them. It says, leave my abundance where you got it. And then let those that are poor and strangers, let them come also to the place of abundance and receive the things that I have provided. I would like to close at this point just to say that um, we have uh, some challenging times ahead of us but just know that God is still on the throne God is still in control God's spirit is still in our midst we just need to look up and receive that which he has placed before us our prayer is that the power of God's word will compel and convict us as we hear it to do those things that will be pleasing in his sight God bless you